nobody g gave a darn about Eddie, you know, when he was alive, and even less when he died, and um, and all of a sudden. <laughs> I am Criswell. For years I have told the almost unbelievable, related the unreal, and showed it to be more than a fact. Now I tell a tale of the threshold people, so astounding that some of you may faint. This is a story of those in the twilight time, once human, now monsters, in a void between the living and the dead. Monsters to be pitied, monsters to be despised. The ghouls reborn from the innermost depths of the world. Of all the threshold people who labored in the twilight time of low-budget exploitation, one name stands out, Edward D. Wood, Jr. Eddie Wood made movies about monsters, crime, sex, and violence, all on non-existent budgets, but always with poetically bizarre dialogue, microphone reflections, continuity errors, and weirdly mismatched stock footage gave his films the mind-bendingly unreal air of a bad dream. Then as now, a lot of people dismiss his films as low-budget trash. So what? <laughs> In fact, his Plan 9 from Outer Space is widely considered one of the worst films ever made. That's the understatement of the year. But all of his films are hysterically serious and madly autobiographical. One is always considered mad. You want to discover something that others cannot grasp. Ed Wood made movies like nobody else. They're cheap, poorly acted, ineptly assembled, but never dull. Like a car wreck, they're grotesquely fascinating, with a loopy consistency, a magical individual resonance. Wood's films have become true cult classics, triumphs over all obstacles, including his own singular lack of ability. And the facts of Ed's own life were as tragic, dramatic, wild, and ironic as any he dreamed for the screen. Strange sort of bird. Entrepreneur, loyal friend, playboy, satyr, alcoholic, pornographer, and a transvestite with a fetish for Angora. Sounds like a man I'd like to meet. He probably will. He died alone, rejected by the business that he loved. Most of us have our idiosyncrasies. This fellow's was quite pronounced. Yes, but I wonder if it rated the death warrant it received. His wife of 20 years, a fellow Marine, a low-budget producer, a loyal friend, and his leading lady will help tell the story. I'd like to hear the story to the fullest. Only the infinity of the depths of a man's mind can really tell the story. But this is Ed Wood's own story in his voice and in the voices of the characters from the infinite depths of his mind. No one can really tell the story. Mistakes are made. But there is no mistaking the thoughts in a man's mind. A new life is begun. No child is inherently bad. Adults create the world children live in. And in this process, 
Parents play the key role. Glenn's father had no love for his son. His father wanted Glenn to be a football hero or a baseball player so that he could brag to his cronies down at the corner saloon as his cronies bragged to him about their own sons. The sins of the father? You leave my father out of this. That plus the lack of a mother's attention. After school, Alan would go home to find the mother who had always wanted a girl and the father who didn't care one way or the other. Little Eddie Wood, his parents called him Junior, took sanctuary in the cinema, a fantasy dream world where good and bad were clearly defined. Even more than his cowboys, he loved his monsters, Dracula, the Wolfman, the Mummy. He was drawn to play acting, making amateur movies, and wearing costumes. You want to borrow your sister's dress? What for? I want to wear it to the Halloween party. There are names for boys who go around wearing girls' clothes. Oh, don't be silly, darling. You go ahead and wear your sister's dress, Glenn. You always did look much better as a girl than you do as a man. Glenn did wear the dress to the Halloween party. He even took first prize. Then one day, it wasn't Halloween any longer. Eddie Wood invented a female persona for himself. He called himself Shirley. And the way I get it, this character he created, much as an author creates a character in a book, was invented as a love object to take the place of the love he never received in his early youth through lack of it from his parents. Well, well what are you trying to do, psychoanalyze me? I don't think he ever did tell me why, you know. He liked, to, liked the softness of certain fabrics. Then came the fateful year of 1941. He successfully passed his vigorous training. He did not like it, but then there were the weekends for his particular diversions. Then the day of embarkation came. It was raining, it was decorated. He was in Tarawa. 4,000 boys went in and, and 300 came out. He was one of the 300. But underneath his battle fatigues, he wore a red bra and red panties. And he always told me that he just, he hoped that he was killed. He didn't want to be wounded because he could never explain the red panties and, and the bra. Then, as quickly as it had begun, the war was over. He was honorably discharged from the service at the end of the war. He'd received the Silver Star and the Bronze Star for gallantry in action. While he was in an army hospital recuperating from a wound he'd received in New Guinea, he learned a very interesting fact. The fact was that the G.I. Bill could put him through school. Ed studied art and drama, joined a traveling carnival, and headed west to make movies. Ah, the curiosity of you. On the road to ruin, may it ever be so adventurous. Ed Wood wanted to be part of the Hollywood dream. In 1947, he sought work as a writer, director, or actor. Considering when a guy came to Hollywood, didn't know a soul, he wanted to get into the picture business, and how many millions of people come to Hollywood, he was going to be another Orson Welles. He was looking for actresses, and uh, I took my girlfriend, Mona McKinnon, who later did Plan 9 for Modern Space. I told him how handsome he was. And before the interview was over, he told me he was going to make me a star. <laughs> the old line. <laughs> we were living together, and it was uh, scandalous at the time. But he told everybody that we were married. At first, anyway, the first year, he always hid uh, the fact that he liked to cross-dress. Yeah, I had a very big bar, big one, called Surf Girl. And the next thing I know, he comes in, and he's Shirley. I enjoyed him. He was very, very funny. But kind of shocking. Well, it was strange at first, because like I said, I was very naive. I didn't know that much about these things. Young guy at 17. And then he would ask to borrow my Angora sweater. And, you know, I said, well, why? <laughs> and uh, he says, well, I'm getting into this woman's part, and it makes the juices flow. I had another inkling when I was missing some of my soft undies. Where did they go? How did they disappear? He wrote and directed a play based on his war experiences. It flopped miserably. 
but he did find work at Universal Studios in the scheduling department. But he wanted to put his own dreams on film. His chance came in 1953. Producer George Weiss conceived a film to cash in on the Christine Jorgensen story, a man who had his sex surgically changed to female. But as writer and director, Ed turned the movie into the ultimate in self-expression. Glenn or Glenda? Give this man satin undies, a dress, a sweater and a skirt, or even the lounging outfit he has on, and he's the happiest individual in the world. He can work better, think better, he can play better, and he can be more of a credit to his community and his government because he is happy. Glenn is a transvestite, but he is not a homosexual. Transvestism is the term given by medical science to those persons who desperately wish to wear the clothing of the opposite sex, yet whose sex life in all instances remains quite normal. Ed also starred under the name Daniel Davis. Davis was his middle name, but he wanted something more for his film, a star to give it credibility. Say, hey, why don't you try to get that actor, uh, Bela Lugosi? It's right up his alley. Lugosi was old, addicted to painkillers, and considered a has-been by Hollywood. Awestruck, Ed approached his idol with an offer of 500 bucks. Lugosi passed. Bela's wife, Lillian, changed his mind. They needed the cash. So for a thousand bucks, Bela spent a day playing an ambivalent spirit in an armchair, spouting intense and baffling metaphors. Only Ed Wood would have dared cast Dracula as God. People. All going somewhere. All with their own thoughts, their own ideas. All with their own personalities. This surreal juxtaposition of stock footage, compassion, exploitation, and metaphysics was too weird for mainstream, way too mild for burlesque theaters. It bombed. Undaunted, Ed tried again. He'd always loved westerns as a little boy, and television was gobbling new material like crazy. B-movie western stars like Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, and Hopalong Cassidy had found new audiences on TV. Ed shot a 16-millimeter pilot show for a series to be called Crossroads Avenger. He cast the film with his childhood favorites, old Bud Osborne, scowling Kenny Duncan, Tom Tyler, who had also played Captain Marvel and The Mummy, and Tom Keene. Done your last killing. What's your name, mister? Duke. Duke Smith. A lot of Dukes around lately. Funny thing is, they all seem to end in Smith. Duke Smith is good enough for the time being. Sure, Tom Tyler's arthritis made gunplay a little awkward, but the film wasn't much worse than the B Westerns of Eddie's childhood. The problem was, this was 1953, not 1933. You're a pretty smart deputy. Sheriff, now. That's right, and you're going to be a smart one, too. Well, I've got to be hitting the trail again. Eddie told friends that the TV network passed on the show in favor of Wild Bill Hickok. This was a diplomatic way of putting it. Instead, he was hired to direct and co-write Jailbait, a crime thriller with a twist ending involving plastic surgery and mistaken identities. It was foolish to try to make a good movie on the ridiculously low budget. Twenty-three grand. That's how much of a fool I am. Hello, Miss Gregor. Oh, Lieutenant Lawrence. He had been Mr. Universe and Mr. America. When it came to the the kiss, uh, he didn't react to me. And I was prepared to kind of melt into it and give it all I had. And he didn't return anything. So I just thought, gee, it had been a lot better if he'd helped. <laughs> when Lugosi fell ill, the part of the plastic surgeon was filled by silent movie star Herbert mm. Rawlinson, himself suffering from lung cancer. You know, I had to perform a very difficult operation this morning. The victim of an automobile accident. You know that I had to remodel that patient's entire face, and it was strenuous and very, very complicated. 
Plastic surgery at times seems to me to be very, very complicated. The morning after he finished his scenes, Rawlinson died. Even with two features to his credit, Ed remained outside looking in. He talked portrait photographer Ted Allen into a partnership to make a horror film with Lugosi. Allen lit the sets like cabinet of Dr. Caligari, but the money ran out in just three days. Eddie was never good at raising money for his pictures. We uh, were introduced to Loretta King, who um, supposedly had a great deal of money. She looked at the script and uh, picked out my part and said, whoa, this is a part I'd like to do. <laughs> and uh, so if she put up some money, she wanted the part. The twist ending. Loretta King had no money to invest. Ed Wood gave Dolores Fuller a walk-on, and she walked out. I didn't hear you. I said I know what you said, but I didn't hear you. I get it. Months later, Ed convinced his leading man, Tony McCoy, to get his father to refinance the film. Ed assured them both it would be a hit. Sounds logical. Whatever you say. With a small crew, Ed started again. Wrestler Tor Johnson played Bela's mute henchman, Lobo. The lab set included a refrigerator and stove for late-night snacks. Despite the off-repeated rumor, Bela does not call Lobo as gentle as a kitchen. Don't be afraid of Lobo. He's as gentle as a kitten. Ed had sold all rights to the McCoys. He never saw any of the profits. As a writer, Ed tackled juvenile delinquency with a sex switch on gang movies. Playboy playmate Gene Moorhead played a sweet high school girl by day, butch gang leader by night. Take that sweater off. I was like you Shut said. up and do like she says. Do what they say, Shirley. They've got guns. Yes, Shirley, we've got guns. You're very observant for a pretty boy. For God's sake, Cheryl, take the sweater off. Give it to her. The film made hundreds of thousands of dollars and played for years. Ed made less than 500 bucks for the script. In 1955, Bela Lugosi publicly admitted a drug habit, decades before detox became fashionable. When he was released, he was optimistic and ready to work. You're leaving the state hospital tomorrow. Yes, I'm very happy I do, on account that I became a, a new man. New lease of life. I'm cured. You're cured. You feel, I feel like a million dollars. You feel like regular really folks, huh? Sure. Yeah. That is best. I'm looking forward to work again. I understand that. I had an assignment uh, playing the star part in uh, The Guru Goes West. Uh -huh. Yes, and uh, Eddie Woods Eddie Eddie would be the you. producer. And you're going to find that as soon as you leave there. Surely. I was supposed to play in a, a part in a western, which I was really looking forward to, called The Ghoul Goes West. The Ghoul Goes West would have combined Edward's love of cowboys and monsters with Lugosi as a mysterious mortician. Ed's dream cast would have included horror and western veterans John Carradine and Lon Chaney Jr. Faith in the project gave Bela hope while he was undergoing drug rehabilitation. And while he was there, millionaire cowboy singer Gene Autry seemed to ride to the rescue, telling newspapers, I'll make The Ghoul Goes West only if Bela Lugosi does the horror part. Eddie told me that. He told me that he talked to Autry and uh, that he was had a slight interest and that I think Eddie had probably mentioned that Go Lugosi would do the, the ghoul. But evidently Gene Autry watched a couple of Ed's movies. I think I'd better not. Ed did raise $800 to shoot a few minutes of Bela in his Dracula outfit. Nice, 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 nice! But Bela died a few weeks later. At his request, he was buried in the cape of Count Dracula. Ed Wood cobbled together a sci-fi horror script called Grave Robbers from Outer Space, but he needed to stretch those few precious moments of Lugosi footage. A situation easily remedied. He simply dressed his chiropractor in a black cape. If the people in this photograph could suddenly come to life, it can be anyone, my friend. Anyone. In this makeup, it might be even I. It didn't fool anybody, but it almost made sense. Bela covered his face the same way in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. For once that he had some money behind him that he could, could count on, he didn't have to run out every once in a while and get some more to keep the picture going, you know. A low-budget movie that was maybe filmed for about... 15,000. No more than 20. 
Aliens from a distant galaxy attempt to save Earth from itself by reviving the corpses of Earth people. An ex-Marine airline pilot punches out the peace-loving alien and the flying saucer explodes. That's the plot in a nutshell. Shot in five days, it was the Alpha and Omega of Ed Wood's career. The title was the first thing to be changed. The Baptist who funded the film thought grave robbers from outer space was sacrilegious. Audiences sat in awe and disbelief. It was a horror movie without horror. A science fiction movie with no science and very little fiction. Zombies guided by a master plan. Plan 9 from outer space. So began a long descent into poverty and obscurity. Why then is he remembered? Because Ed Wood had a vision. Is that the end of the story? Not quite. I'll get back to it in a minute. Beware of the big green dragon that sits on your doorstep. He eats little boys. Bobby duck tails and big fat snails. My mind's in a muddle, like in a thick fog. I can't make sense to myself sometimes. You see? You see? Your stupid minds! Stupid! Stupid! The world is a strange place to live in. All those cars, all going someplace, all caring humans which are carrying out their lives. I don't know what you're talking about. Calling an Ed Wood script illogical is like saying dreams make no sense. Images and words went straight from his mind to the page. It's the way I work. Fast. His stream of consciousness dialogue was like a ransom note pasted together from words randomly cut out of a Korean electronics manual. I guess I've seen everything there is for a policeman to see. Yet I wonder if we ever stop learning. Learning about which we see. Trying to learn more about uh, an ounce of prevention. This type of case comes to me as well as yourself many times during the course of one month. It's tough to find something when you don't know what you're looking for. You know what that thing is, monsters? This is the 20th century. Don't count on it. Although I've never even met the gentleman, but Inspector John, he seems like a, a fan of mine. This afternoon, we had a long telephone conversation earlier in the day. Eddie was, sometimes he was so serious in what he wrote, but it didn't come out that way in the movie. <laughs> Why is it so important that you want to contact the governments of our Earth? Because all you of Earth are idiots. We did have a Bible there, and I did pick it up for some reason. You also think it impossible that we, too, might think of God? There was something, some passage there, something about the solar... When you have the solarite, you have nothing. You speak of solarite, the solarite. So what if we do develop this solarite bomb? The solarite. That's all I'm taking from you. Get back here, you jerk! Sexual imagery bubbled to the surface in the most unlikely places, like hickeys on laboratory victims. Double. You carrying a rod now? Sure. Slip it to me quick. What? Hey, Edie, how about you and me bowling it up in Albuquerque? And, uh, Bob, being a pretty girl, don't take any chances. That's a cute pair. They had their point. Pussycat is born to be whooped. He shared his fetish with at least one character in everything he wrote. But at heart, he remained a ladies' man. Now, I love girls. Girls, 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 tall ones, fat ones, skinny ones. It doesn't matter any kind of girl. Blonde, brunette, redhead. Girls, girls, girls. I have only one problem. 
There is no enough time for all of them. A marriage to Norma McCarthy lasted just long enough for Norma to meet Shirley. I don't put much stock in the future success of our married life. If already you're holding out secrets on me. I used to drop in at this place on Sunset. He's sitting there at the bar all by himself, and he's tears are rolling down his face. I always feel sorry for a lost puppy dog or a stray cat or a good-looking guy that's crying and I wanted to meet him. It's just like um, something was drawing us together. Kathy Wood stayed with him from 1956 till the bitter end. Do you love her? Very much. Does she love you? Yes. There's no problem. But there was a problem. Ed Wood had a date with destiny. Life is life. Many things are not of our choosing. But we must face that which is ordained us. Destiny is a strange and mysterious thing, my dear Inspector. With no money or time, Edward's filmmaking style had to be straightforward. Shoot first if I give the signal and ask questions later. So what he lacked in production value, he made up in enthusiasm, energy, and speed. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret of mine that I use all the time. And it's a great technique. If you want to use it, my technique, use it in good health. His secret was intercutting stock footage with new action. This technique can make a small picture look impressive when done right. Luckily, he rarely did it right. Here the Mad Doctor becomes an atomic Superman. A stock shot lightning bolt causes a stock shot explosion and fire. The police try to kill Lugosi, but he deflects their bullets by twitching, shrugging, and making faces. A stock footage octopus attacks. The half-dressed hero rolls a paper mache boulder onto Bela Lugosi's stuntman. Bela flails with a flaccid rubber octopus stolen from Republic Studios, while a stock shot lightning bolt causes the atomic monsters to reach critical mass, transforming into a stock shot atomic explosion. But occasionally, Ed used stock shots as weird visual counterpoint. File footage of traffic in a foundry contrast with Wood's off-screen plea for understanding. Every weekend and back to the sweatshops. Say, did you read about the guy that had his sex changed to a girl? Says he was perfectly normal, too. How can a guy be normal and go and do a thing like that to himself? Do you realize what would happen if every man in the country that wanted to wear women's clothes or felt like a woman went to their doctors and wanted a sex change? Of course. That's why I say perhaps society should be a little bit more lenient, but maybe society should try to understand them as human beings. Another day done. Thank goodness. See you tomorrow, Jack. Yeah. So long, Joe. Wood's most alarming use of a stock shot was a buffalo stampede in Glen or Glenda. I hope not. I really hope not. Glenn, is it another woman? Only Ed could explain the significance. Story must be told. He was unique. He was an original. In the twilight time of Ed Wood films, concepts like day and night became something less than a fact. Ramblers magically transform into Fords. Men became women by changing their clothes and putting on a wig. Women became men by changing their clothes and putting on a mask. Never be sure what's behind a mask. A cape transforms Bela Lugosi into a vampire, a chiropractor into Bela Lugosi, and Criswell into a chiropractor. I have but to touch you with my finger, and it would mean the end of you all over. Sets and props were blissfully unreal, the way a child pretends a stick is a rifle or a driveway a frontier fort. Painted ovals symbolically stand in for stone walls. A photographic enlarger becomes an atomic death ray machine. 
And occasionally, chiropractors fall out of their costume. So what? Edward had other things on his mind. He was putting his own wacky poetry on screen. It is said on clear nights, beneath the cold light of the moon, how the dog and the wolf and creeping things crawl out of the slime. It is then the ghouls feast in all their radiance. The night things are all about me. Every shadow, a beckoning invitation to disaster, which can take any shape here in the darkness, any shape my mind can conceive. Whatever the merit of his art, Ed Wood reached into his own soul to create it. don't like him, the critics don't like him, the public don't like him, and I don't like him. Who likes him? Everyone who met him liked Eddie Wood. Charming, funny, pixie-ish. His energy was infectious. He gathered around him a veritable United Nations of friends who helped bring his quirky vision to life. Hungarian Bela Lugosi, typecast as a bogeyman, addicted to booze and morphine, but longing for a comeback. Finnish Myla Nurmi, who set the style for TV horror hostesses as Vampira. Swedish wrestler Tor Johnson, his 400-pound bulk regularly shattered Ed's I'll toilet seats. From patrol car. Be careful, please. I'm a big boy now, Johnny. Criswell, a flamboyantly inaccurate TV psychic who predicted nine old women on the Supreme Court and an influx of cannibalism across America. <laughs> Veteran Lyle Talbot, best known as Ozzy and Harriet's TV neighbor. Come on, boy, drinks are on me. B movie stalwart Timothy Farrell. Paul Marco, who played bumbling Kelton the cop in three films. Dolores Fuller. Conrad Brooks. Character actor Harvey B. Dunn. Don Nagel, Tom Keene, Western heavy Kenny Duncan. Duke Moore, who never got acting jobs outside of Eddie Wood's films. Not exactly the old Vic or the Mercury Theater, but they were friends. And they worked cheap. He very seldom ever told an actor what to do. He more or less left it up to you. And he didn't have the time for that. He was doing too many other things. But he was so affable, he rarely asked his actors for a second take. There usually wasn't time. Compare this rare outtake from Glenn or Glenda to the actual scene used in the movie. where I take my sweater off and then kind of throw it to him. And that was the first take and probably my true feelings. <laughs> so the acting styles of the Woodstock Company range from comatose to barnstorming, melodramatic to just plain lousy. You will be soon as big as a giant, or like all the others, dead. <laughs> Tor Johnson as the walking dead. Turn off your electro gun! No! No! Stop me, Dennis! I can't get it, it's jammed! Stop him, you fool! I gotta get him before he can spill his story. You stay here. Stay here, he said. Why does he suppose I'd go dressed in this? But acting in an Ed Wood movie could be the kiss of death, sometimes literally. Bela Lugosi and Herbert Rawlinson died in harness. After his Ed Wood films, Tor Johnson played in only two minor movies and died in 1971 at 68. Time for go to bed. Kenny Duncan died the next year. Stuck with $80,000 worth of bills from Bride of the Atom, Tony McCoy left show business entirely. I'll live to see you hang. After Plan 9, Myla Nurmi bowed out. Her career was dead enough, she didn't want to drive a stake through its heart. So Ed made his own vampira, or facsimiles thereof, like Fawn Silver. It took years for Greg Walcott to re-establish his career in films like The Iger Sanction and Norma Ray. Joanna Lee became an award-winning writer-director and cheerfully denies appearing in Plan 9. Steve Reeves became a star of Muscle Man films in spite of, not because of, his role in Jailbait. To be blunt, the further people got out of Ed's orbit, the better luck they had. Dolores Fuller finished college and went on to write 18 hit songs for Elvis Presley movies. 
But many of his friends stayed, hoping Ed's luck would change. It did. It got worse. Ed Wood made Plan 9 on money raised by his landlord, J. Edward Reynolds. Reynolds worried about his investment, but Ed was sure he could sell it to a distributor. Sure it had cardboard sets, atrocious acting, and a star who was dead, Ed still felt it was his best film. Ah, my dear, what I'm going to show you right now will be a feast before your very eyes. What have you got this time? More junk? His head would have to be soft to peddle that kind of garbage. I wonder how it happens. For three years, Ed was turned down by every Hollywood studio. They didn't want his film, they didn't want his scripts, and they didn't want him. Anxious to make his own money back, J. Edward Reynolds offered to buy out Ed's rights in the film for one dollar. Ed didn't have a choice. If it's the only way, I'm for it. Maybe you shouldn't have done that. Oh, and even Pauline came over, Reynolds' wife, she, she didn't get any money out of it either. And so none of us did. Nearing 40 years old, Ed Wood remained ready for his big break, but his career was a cycle of rejection, turmoil, and booze. His behavior became more erratic. That's the one thing I can't figure. He comes to the office, and with all these monster stories, makes an appointment to come out here with us, then it goes off by himself. But other times, there are compensations. Sometimes I even hit a lucky day. He had a lucky day in 1959. Producer Adrian Weiss hired him to write a tale of apes, angora, and stock footage. You make me feel like King Kong. The queen of the gorillas is reincarnated as a beautiful brunette who loves angora. This puzzles both her gun-wielding husband and her hairy ex-husband. In the twist ending, the ape and the girl live happily ever after. Ed convinced a fellow ex-marine into backing a ghost film, Revenge of the Dead. But once more, Ed Wood stretched himself and the budget too far, overlooking certain minor details. The payroll, remember? Yeah, I forgot. And the developing lab refused to release the film until Ed paid the bill. I uh, think we'll hold on to that for a little while. You have no right to keep my property. We've got all the rights right now. Everything. Negatives and all. Revenge of the Dead, also called Night of the Ghouls, was never released to theaters. Ed's natural buoyancy began to fail. Desperation replaced optimism. His last chance came in 1961, a crime thriller that was strangely prophetic. Now, Matt, this smut picture racket has got to be stopped. Pornography. A nasty word for a dirty business. The villain trapped by fate and his own weakness was autobiographical. Ed's own movie posters decorated the office walls. I look at this slush and try to remember. At one time I made good movies. It seems you have chosen your own fate. Live with it. I should say die with it. Pull the string. Dance to that. One is created for. No one wishes to see a man dad. Are gangster and horror pictures all you produce? <laughs> Those are made by friends of mine. I think you'll find my type of picture entirely different. He wrote scores of sex films and books, signing his own name with perverse pride. <laughs> so he brings me a script which consisted of around 29 pages, 28 pages. I said, how on earth am I going to make a 90-minute picture? <laughs> These never-before-seen home movies show Ed Wood, director Stephen Apostoloff, and the cast and crew of Orgy of the Dead. I had to, the smoke machine, in order to create the, the fog effect. Chris cannot see. He goes like this, he's squirming. <laughs> and he's reading. So it was, you can see he was staring at the cue cards and not at me. Well? Ah, she will be yours. When? At your discretion. But first, I desire more entertainment. The moon is almost gone. Ah, oh, there is yet time. Actually, he was the production manager. Yeah, he was um, jackass of all trades and things like that, you know. He helped. Eddie was in the back the first day of shooting, but he didn't know it. I didn't know that was the first association which I had with him. I did not have his drinking problem was so uh, acute. Bob Dertano, who was my assistant director, he said, don't give money to Eddie until the picture is finished. 
Well, Larry hit me a couple of days later, you know, a little bit here, he gave me $50, $35, and so on and so forth. <laughs> he was drunk. Later on, I found in, in the desk of the production office uh, half a bottle of vodka, you know, and just, Eddie was my friend. So he was a nice guy. But the booze killed him. In Orgy of the Dead, Demons force a horror writer and his girlfriend, Shirley, to suffer through the tortures of the damned. Mainly, a series of awful strip-tease acts. I was um, unhappy to hear that he was doing porno pictures and that he was drinking too much. Ed could tell himself he was earning a living in the movie business, but he drank his income as soon as he earned it. He and Kathy lost their home and eventually moved into a sordid apartment on Yucca Street in the slums of Hollywood. The place we were living in was, was pretty crummy. It was dangerous, in fact. I think that's what killed Eddie when we got kicked out of that place. You know, in those days, he was drinking more than ever. Could turn things out all night, you know, just do a whole script in five or six hours. But at that point, he was downhill. Booze bloated his face and fogged his mind. He regaled friends with grand plans for new films. Well, listen, Derek, I've, I've got an awful lot of appointments today, but um, I suppose we drop by around 3 o'clock this afternoon. They wanted to believe. How can you be so sure? Some will turn up. It always does. But it never did. The cheesy films he wrote, directed, and even acted in made Plan 9 look tasteful by comparison. It all seems like such a bad dream. When children grow up among adults who refuse to recognize anything that is fine and good or worthy of respect, it's no wonder that many of these children fail to develop high moral standards or to distinguish right from wrong. I couldn't think straight. It wasn't until night came again that my brain cleared. Funny thing about remembering. You never remember the right things until it's too late. The life I relived wasn't very pleasant. Anyway, not for me. At one time I made good movies. <laughs> Here I am, reduced to crawling like a, a whipped dog. Will it never end? Help me. Help me. This isn't real. It can't be. I, I must be dreaming. But I'm not. I can't make it. I can't make it. I can't make it! Had Johnny stayed honest, he might have been a big man in the motion picture business. I'm gonna try! I'm gonna try! Fred Olin Ray, a young producer-director from Florida, found Ed and asked him to write a real movie script. A low-budget sci-fi horror spoof. Well... Here we go again. Ray grew up with Woods films and appreciated them for what they were. Fred Ray shot a few minutes of the film to try to raise money, just as Ed Wood did years before. The film was never finished. Hey. I'd like to say for Bob. We're in. Now let's find Bebe before they turn him in the package. Right. Could this have been Ed's last chance? The one big break he was always looking for? Nah. Is, is that thing loaded? <laughs> you just try me. Find out. <laughs> you don't try to follow it, so you ain't get him in for big trouble. <laughs> the few dollars for the script were gone fast. Ed's drinking made him unreliable even for the porno market. I venture to say it was a week or so before he died, or two weeks maybe, and uh, he didn't look good. He didn't look good at all. December the 10th, 78. Broke, beaten by rejection and ill from alcohol, Ed was evicted from his shabby apartment. His manuscripts, films and mementos were tossed into a garbage bin. It was a week before Christmas. I have no home. But living like an animal that I will show the world that I can be its master I don't feel so well I 
it she keeps going around. Then one day it could all be gone. All that out there. The stars, the planets, all just an empty void. A life is ended. But in the years since then, his films, scripts, and stories have gained a cult popularity they never had originally. With film festivals, TV marathons, and video re-releases. Here the guy is a complete failure. You know, in, in our way of thinking, made slot pictures, you know, and uh, and suddenly he's he's famous. It's, it's amazing, but kind of shocking. Periodicals like Psychotronic and Cult Movies Magazine praise the films as sincere, subversive, delirious, terms so glowing that even Eddie Wood might have wondered what the hell they were talking about. We need a psychiatrist to explain it to you. Kansas City entrepreneur Wade Williams paid a 23-year-old lab bill and sent Night of the Ghouls out to a waiting video audience. Filmmaker Mark Carducci's documentary on Plan 9 from Outer Space runs a half hour longer than the film itself. A biography of Wood by Rudolph Gray, Nightmare of Ecstasy, was published by Ferrell Press in 1992. It sold out and became the basis of a script by Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski, filmed by director Tim Burton on a budget more than 100 times greater than every Ed Wood budget combined. Uh, for my dear country now believes in my work and that it can be a success. Twenty years ago, I was classed as a madman, a charlatan. Now, here in this forsaken jungle hell, I have proven that I am all right. Ed Wood finally got his break. He became a hot Hollywood property. He just had to be dead to do it. But then, Eddie Wood loved twist endings. Our fitting climax to an evening's entertainment. Eddie Wood displayed his heart and soul on film. The world rejected it. But the world changed, and his films will stay the same forever. He had the enthusiasm, but he never had the time or the money to make a really good movie. Maybe he never really had the talent. But we can appreciate this crazy vision for what it is, and maybe even accept him for what he was. And there's one important difference between Ed Wood and all the other would-be filmmakers the world over. I tried, honestly, I tried. Something shines through the nightmares and the sex, the shoddy sets and the lousy dialogue. What can it be? Love is the only answer. Eddie Wood loved movies. Oh, snips and snails and puppy duck tails. In spite of all the sadness that Eddie went through in his work, Eddie was triumphant in the end. And there's a chance to see an Eddie Wood classic next on BBC Two, Glen or Glenda. Cut. That's the end of that one.